And now, it's my pleasure to introduce David L. Roll. David is the author of The Hopkins Touch, Harry Hopkins, and the Forging of the Alliance to Defeat Hitler. He is a partner at Steptoe and Johnson, LLP, and founder of Lex Mundi Pro Bono Foundation, a public interest organization that provides pro bono legal services to social entrepreneurs around the world. He was awarded the Purpose Prize Fellowship by Civic Ventures in 2009. Roll lives with his wife Nancy and their dog Thatcher in Washington, D.C. and Glen Arbor, Michigan. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. David Roll. Thank you. Looks like we have a, a lot of scholars and experts in this audience. So I'm going to have to be on my toes. Um, so, Harry Hopkins, a spectral figure in the administration of President Franklin Roosevelt. Slightly sinister. Kind of a... Uh, a ramshackle character, but uh, boyishly attractive. He was gaunt, pauper thin, <clears throat> but full of nervous energy, fueled by lucky strikes and caffeine. Um, he was an experienced social worker, in-your-face New Deal reformer, but he preferred the company of the rich and the well-born. They said he had a mind like a razor, a tongue like a skinning knife. A New Yorker uh, profile described, described him uh, as a purveyor of wit and anecdote. Loved to tell the story of the time that uh, Roosevelt wheeled himself into Winston Churchill's bedroom unannounced. It's during the time that Churchill was living in the White House. He just emerged from his afternoon bath, gleaming pink. Starkers, as they say in the UK. And he gave the president a full frontal shot. The president was embarrassed, backed out. Think nothing of it, Thunder Churchill. Prime Minister of Great Britain has nothing to hide from the President of the United States. Whether true or not, there's some doubt about this. Uh, Harry Hopkins dined out in that story for years. Um, he, was a, he was a gambler, a better on horses, cards, even the time of day. Married three times. Between his uh, second and third marriages dated glamorous women, movie stars like Paulette Goddard. Actresses, there's an actress named Dorothy Hale who jumped to her death from her Essex House apartment, allegedly because she'd been jilted by Harry. And then, of course, there was the glamorous former Paris editor of Harper's Bazaar, who uh, Harry married upstairs in the White House, summer of 1942. He regarded money, his own, as well as other people's something to be spent as quickly as possible. Put people into two categories, talkers and doers. And Harry Hopkins was definitely a doer. The book, my book, uh, The Hopkins Touch, opens May 10, 1940. That was a year and a half before the United States entered the Second World War. It was the day that uh, the Germans overran the Low Countries and Hitler's panzer divisions were massed in the Ardennes forest, ready to invade Luxembourg and France. It was the day that Churchill became Prime Minister of Great Britain. And within a few weeks, the rest of Europe would be under the Nazi swastika. That evening, May 10, 1940, um, Roosevelt and Hopkins were upstairs in the White House, the Oval Study. Just finished dinner bantering and gossiping as usual. Um, that time, Hopkins was 49, spring of 1940, 49, and the president was 57. 
they had known one another for a decade. Um, Eleanor and Franklin Roosevelt had consoled Harry following the death of his second wife, Barbara, of breast cancer in 1937. And since that time, Mrs. Roosevelt was the surrogate mother, served as the surrogate mother for Harry's young daughter, Diana, who at that time was seven. Diana today lives out in Vienna, Virginia. Um, so by the spring of 1940, uh, Harry was almost a member of the Roosevelt family. He was, at that time, the president's closest friend, advisor, confidant, if anybody could be said to be a confidant of Roosevelt's. Now, the president sensed that Hopkins was not feeling well on that evening. He knew, of course, that Hopkins had had one-third some said one half, this fellow says 90% of Harry's stomach had been removed by the surgeons at the Mayo Clinic a couple of years before. The diagnosis then was cancer. And this fellow says that there is an actual biopsy that shows that. Um, and since that time, of course, he had been unable to regain in his weight something terribly wrong with his digestive system. Um, so the president that evening said, insisted that Harry spend the night. But Harry Hopkins was <laughs> the man who came to dinner and never left. Um, for the next three and one half years, he lived upstairs in the southeast corner of the White House, just a couple doors down from the president's own bedroom. And his daughter, Diana, lived on the third floor during that time, near the Sky Parlor. And without any particular title or portfolio, Hopkins set up a card table in that big Lincoln room where he lived, and he did the business of the president from there. So as a, as a nation um, was drawn into the maelstrom of the Second World War, Harry Hopkins would live upstairs in the White House, and he would devote his life, literally his life, to helping the president win the war. He would shortly form a lifelong friendship with Winston and Clementine Churchill. He would earn a, uh, a measure of respect, perhaps an iota of trust, from Joseph Stalin, um, brutal dictator of the Soviet Union, who he would meet with several times during the war. And he would play a critical role, I argue in the book, the critical role in, in establishing and preserving coalition between the United States, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union that won the war. So what was it about Harry that enabled him to climb to the pinnacle of wartime diplomacy? His origins provide few clues. He was born in Iowa in 1890, the son of an itinerant harness maker with champagne tastes. His father, Al, traveled the Midwest hawking harnesses, gambling, and probably on bowling matches. His, his father was a, a ferociously competitive bowler. His mother, Anna, was a strict church-going social uh, so, uh, strict uh, church-going Methodist, a believer in uh, social justice, helping the poor. And it was she that insisted the family settle down in Grinnell, Iowa, the home of Grinnell College. For Harry, Grinnell College was foundational. Its impressive faculty at the time was devoted to the, uh, the social gospel movement, the idea that the principles of Christianity could be applied to solving the nation's social ills. And uh, <clears throat> for Harry graduated from, uh, for, well, Harry graduated from Grinnell in 1912, followed the uh, path of his sister Ada, became a social worker. His first, first job was at the uh, Christadora House, settlement house in the Lower East Side of Manhattan where the largest concentration of immigrants in the United States lived. For the next 20, 20 plus years, 
Harry would rise to leadership positions, not only at the Christadora House, but several other large social welfare, social service agencies. And uh, the bid to late 1920s, he was among the best known social workers in America. He co-founded the American Association of Social Workers. But as he, as he rose to the top of his profession, his marriage, his first marriage, began to lose its stitches. He had married Ethel Gross in 1913. She was the, a Hungarian-born Jewish woman who grew up in one of the tenement houses near the Christora house. But she'd been mentored by some of the women in the upper ranks, upper ranks of uh, New York liberal society. So she was committed to the social causes of the day, as was Harry. They, um, they raised three boys. But around 1926, 1927, Harry began to feel that Ethel was too clingy, too needy. And besides, Harry had inherited his father's champagne tastes. He hung out at nights, speakeasies with his pals in Manhattan. He uh, gambled. He borrowed a lot of money. He was uh, addicted to English romantic poetry, Keats had an affair with a woman in his office. He fell in love with her, um, felt terribly guilty. Hired a psychoanalyst in 1929 with the hope that he could be talked out of this love affair. Didn't work. Um, in the uh, the depths of despair and with the onset of the depression, um, Harry divorced Ethel, leaving her to raise the three boys. The divorce decree provided that half of his salary, if he, if he had one, would go to her. But in a sense, the, uh, the Great Depression was a, a, was a godsend to Harry because it was the Depression that introduced him to Eleanor and, and Franklin Roosevelt. And it was the Depression that uh, enabled him and his new wife, Barbara, the woman from the office, to move down to Washington D.C. with uh, unemployment running at 25% in 1933, the, the new president, Franklin Roosevelt, hired, and during the first 100 days, hired Harry to uh, head up the first in a series of his jobs programs, culminating in 1935 with Harry's appointment to head the WPA, the Works Progress Administration. Um, whose mission was to put Americans back to work on infrastructure projects. Sounds kind of familiar. It was the centerpiece of the New Deal. Surviving on uh, coffee and cigarettes and looking as if he'd slept in the office at night, which he often did, Harry and his staff at the WPA achieved spectacular results. They put 8.5 million Americans back to work pump 10 billion into the economy. Harry uh, famously reported to Roosevelt, well, boss, they're all back at work, but for God's sake, don't ask me what they're doing. Uh, by the mid to late 1930s, Harry was among the most uh, visible of uh, Roosevelt's uh, New Deal administration. His face was on the cover of Time magazine twice. Hung out with the Harrimans and the Swopes and the Kennedys. And then in 1938-39, with the president's encouragement, <laughs> Harry began promoting himself as a presidential candidate. Uh, looking at the elections in 1940. Leased a farm in Iowa. Of course, what else do you do? Um, rejoined the uh, Methodist Church in Grinnell. Uh, his hopes came crashing down. Hundreds of uh, newspapers reported a story uh, about a comment that Harry allegedly made to a friend at the racetrack. The comment was, we shall tax and tax, spend and spend, elect and elect. Uh, and whether true or not, Harry denied that comment, but uh, stuck with him for the rest of his life, became a rallying cry for those who hated Roosevelt. Uh, 
uh, in the New Deal. And as if that were not enough, in uh, the fall of 1939, when <clears throat> war was breaking out in Europe, Harry found himself back at the Mayo Clinic. Doctors had ruled out a recurrence of cancer. They eventually came, out, came up with the president's assistance uh, with a dog's breakfast of uh, intravenous feedings and blood transfusions and injections of liver extract, combinations of, of which were administered to Harry for the rest of his life. And for the rest of his life, he was unable to uh, regain his weight. Um, he was often literally on the verge of starvation. So in the spring of 1940, this is before he'd moved into the White House, Harry was uh, at home, a tiny rented Georgetown house, recovering with his daughter Diana and his dog uh, Buffer. Uh, and uh, the president at that time, the spring of 1940, had some daunting challenges on his mind. The president knew that Hitler would soon turn his armies to the west, envelop the rest of Europe, threaten to invade the British islands. The president knew that uh, the Japanese were on the march in the far east, aggressive designs on the uh, oil-rich Dutch East Indies. Uh, the country's national security was gravely threatened. And of course, the country was hopelessly isolationist. The, uh, the Democrats were scheduled to convene their convention in July 1940, Chicago. The president had to decide whether to stand or run for an unprecedented third term as president, or whether to step aside, uh, come back to his library here, and become a lame duck president. Hadn't had such a great second term. The court packing fiasco, unemployment was still running at 15%. It by no means found a solution to the Great Depression. <clears throat> but, but Roosevelt sensed an opportunity, an opportunity to achieve greatness as a wartime president. War was coming. And these thoughts were on the president's mind that night of May 10, 1940, when he insisted that his friend and advisor, Harry Hopkins, live in the White House. Now, what was it that caused him to initiate such an intimate, close relationship with this man, Harry Hopkins? Well, a number of things, the first of which came from Roosevelt himself. After he had beaten Wendell Wilkie in 1940 for the uh, presidency, <clears throat> Wilkie was in the president's office. The two had remained friends. Wilkie said to uh, Roosevelt, why do you keep that man so close to you? Uh, talking about Hopkins. And uh, Wilkie did not like Hopkins. And Roosevelt said, you know, you may be in this office someday, you'll understand, but that man asked for nothing except to serve me. And he was right. By that time, Hopkins had set aside any kind of a political or personal agenda. And secondly, Roosevelt drew him close because he knew through experience that Hopkins had superb judgment, razor-sharp political instincts. Hopkins was a, a linear thinker. The, uh, Roosevelt was a, a visionary. His thoughts were vague and disconnected. And, Hopkins had this ability to translate, transform the president's thoughts into concrete action. And thirdly, they were close because Hopkins knew how to read the president's moods. He came as close as anyone to gaining admittance to what uh, Robert Sherwood called Roosevelt's heavily forested interior. In the presence of the president, Hopkins knew when to remain totally silent, when to uh, press his point, when to back off and tell a joke, qualities that uh, the president's wife um, never learned. 
you know, and and, and also they were close because Hopkins was great company. Roosevelt loved to be around him. Called him Harry the Hop. Hopkins would come back from nights on the town in Manhattan, tell of his exploits. He would, uh, he was a window into worlds that Roosevelt, because of his paralysis, could not occupy. Hopkins would dish the gossip from the great country houses where he lived on weekends. <clears throat> and you know, Churchill used to say that Hopkins had the gift of sardonic humor. And he did. He was terribly funny in a sarcastic kind of way. And finally, they were close, very close because they shared disabilities. Um, that on the one hand, handicapped them and the other empowered them. And Roosevelt knew as only he could the kind of courage it took Hopkins to get through those days when he was starving, literally starving. <clears throat> so as the uh, the fateful year 1940 was coming to a close. Um, Hopkins, by that time, had been living in the White House for eight months. He'd become virtually indispensable. He, during that summer of 1940, he went off to Chicago, commandeered two, two hotel rooms, orchestrated the so-called draft that got the president the nomination, went up to New York, helped to organize the fall campaign, uh, put together the famous speechwriting team of Sam Rosenman, and Robert Sherwood, the playwright, and himself. Um, and then after the election was over, early December 1940, the two of them, just the two of them, left Washington, boarded the, the cruiser Tuscaloosa, cruised in the Mediterranean, or in the uh, Caribbean, not the Mediterranean, Caribbean, and that's where they came up with the, uh, the idea of Lend-Lease. The idea that America, the arsenal of democracy, would provide the countries fighting the Germans with a war material that they needed. And they wouldn't have to pay until after the end of the war. It's called Lend-Lease. Lend me your garden hose, said Roosevelt. <clears throat> and then on the last night of 1940, London was burning, still burning. The citizens of London had undergone four straight months of what was called the Blitz. Almost every night, fleets of German bombers appeared over the city, bombed without restriction or limitation, houses, apartments, flats, shipyards, factories. Thousands of Londoners had perished in the Blitz. Um, Hitler's armies were 21, 22 miles across the English Channel, ready to invade when Great Britain broke. On December 29, 1940, that was the night that Roosevelt gave his arsenal of democracy speech in Washington. In London, the largest single attack of the Blitz took place. Hundreds of German bombers appeared over the city that night, and uh, they vectored using a radio beam on St. Paul's Cathedral. They dropped millions of incendiaries around the cathedral in the old city. So on New Year's Eve, 1940, London was burning and uh, Churchill drafted a cable. Dear Mr. President, I do not know what is in your mind and we do not know what America plans to do. But we are fighting for our lives. Ten days later, January 10, 1941, Hopkins found himself in the basement of number 10 Downing Street, Prime Minister's residence, having lunch alone with Winston Churchill. The windows upstairs in that house had been blown out by the bombs. That's why they're in the basement. Hopkins had been sent over to London, uh, to England, by, uh, by Roosevelt in a Boeing Clipper. And, uh, his mission was to assess whether Churchill and, the, and his government and the British people could withstand these attacks by the Germans from the air and also, more importantly, from the sea. And if he felt they could survive, he was to uh, convey to them the idea that America was, would, would provide them with the tools they needed to fight off the Germans. But he could not commit America to going to war. <clears throat> 
It was a, a long, liquid lunch. <clears throat> and of that first meeting, Churchill wrote in his memoirs, Thus I met Harry Hopkins, that extraordinary man who played and was to play a sometimes decisive part in the whole movement of the war. His was a soul, wrote Churchill, that flamed out of a frail and failing body. He was a crumbling lighthouse from which there shone great beams that led, or beams that led great fleets to harbor. Then he said, I always, I always, I always enjoyed his company, especially when things went ill, but he could be very disagreeable and say hard and sour things. Churchill's, Churchill's words. So Harry Hopkins had established an incredibly important special relationship with Winston Churchill. And a few weeks later, mid-January 1941, he cemented a relationship with the British people. It happened um, at the station house hotel in Glasgow, Scotland. Um, there was a big dinner, um, lots of dignitaries present. Church, uh, Churchill was there. Hopkins was at the, uh, the head table. And they asked him to speak after dinner, and they, they said he looked uh, frail, tired, unkempt. They asked him to speak, and he rose, and he raised his glass. He said, I, I suppose you wish to know what I plan to tell the president when I return to the United States. Well, I will quote you one verse from the book of books and the truth of which my Scottish mother was raised. Whither thou goest, I will go. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people. Thy God, my God, <clears throat> even to the end. Well, Churchill, of course, was brought to tears. This was no great feat. He's kind of like John Boehner. <laughs> but, but more importantly, Hopkins' words, especially that phrase, even to the end, spread rapidly throughout all of Great Britain. He had thrown a lifeline to the British people, bent in battle and frightened British people, and, and they... Uh, they never forgot. So during, those, uh, during that first trip to England, a period of six weeks, January and February 1941, Blitz was still on. Uh, and during his subsequent visits to England during the war, there were several. Hopkins would spend most weekends with Winston and Clementine Churchill, living with them at Chequers, the, uh, the prime minister's uh, country residence. Now Clementine, Clementine was famous for not being prone to take to people that she did not know. And she, she famously did not take to Roosevelt at all the first time she met him. But Harry Hopkins was an exception. She was captivated by him from the very beginning. She, she loved his, um, his offbeat raffishness and his mordant sense of humor. She was amused by his constant complaints to her about his itchy long underwear and the, and the lack of heat in the drafty old house. He would, Hopkins would spend hours in the downstairs bathroom where the heat pipes ran through, shivering in his long wool overcoat and his hat and his scarf and his working on his memos and cables. And at nighttime, Clementine would mother him uh, he would be upstairs drinking brandy with Winston well after midnight, and she would come up and rescue him, tell him that uh, it was time to go to bed and that she'd put a hot water bottle uh, in between the sheets. She, she marveled at his touch, his distinct touch with her grumpy husband, how he could poke fun at Churchill without offending him. One morning, Churchill... Um, turned to Hopkins and said, this water tastes funny. 
course it does, said Hopkins. It's got no whiskey in it. Fancy you a judge of water. <laughs> so there was another dinner. This one was at uh, Claridge's, West End of London. Blitz was still on, late January 1941, hosted by the um, lords, the barons of the British press. Churchill was not invited. Hopkins was the guest of honor. And the journalists who were there noted what uh, Hopkins looked like and what he said. They said he looked shy and untidy. They asked him to speak after dinner. Instead of addressing the group as a whole, he proceeded to walk slowly around that big table, stopping at each of the clusters of cluster of journalists and speaking to them quietly and reassuringly. And he gave them the sense that night that while America was not yet in the war, she was marching beside them and the British people. And then one of the journalists wrote, we were happy men all. Our confidence and our courage had been stimulated by a contact which Shakespeare and Henry V had a phrase, a little touch of Harry in the night. Well, the Hopkins touch was not little, well, nor was it light. In a few months, January or July 1941, Hopkins would initiate an incredibly dangerous 30 plus hour flight from the north coast of Scotland around the North Cape of Norway and down into besieged Moscow. July 1941. At the time, the German divisions were marching along the same route that Napoleon took in 1812 toward the gates of Moscow. They were capturing and killing Red Army soldiers, not just by the thousands, but sometimes by the hundreds of thousands. They seemed unstoppable. And at night, the Luftwaffe was bombing Moscow. The Hopkins spent two very long nights in the Kremlin, alone except for interpreters, with uh, Joseph Stalin. And he'd be criticized later. But he told Stalin that the United States was prepared to provide the Soviet Union, the Red Army, with whatever they needed, no strings attached, no questions asked, so long as they kept killing Germans by the bushel. And from that time forward, Stalin accorded Hopkins, as I said, a measure of uh, respect, perhaps even a degree of trust that he accorded no other outsider. And Stalin used to say of, of uh, Hopkins that Hopkins spoke Padusha, Padusha, Russian for according to the soul, which is a Russian accolade that denoted strength and depth of compassion and character. So during the war years, Hopkins was the pectin and the glue. He knew that victory depended upon a, holding together that fragile coalition, Churchill, Stalin, Roosevelt. And that was the key to victory. And he, he, would, he, he focused like a, like a laser on that issue. And uh, Churchill used to make a joke of Hopkins' ability to focus. Uh, during wartime conferences, he would uh, pretend that Hopkins was a member of the peerage, call him Lord Root of the Matter. So there's a lot more to the story, but uh, let me close by um, paraphrasing a few words from the end of the book. In the end, um, the quality or the word, the word that comes close to, closest to the quality that enabled Harry to achieve success is touch. A little touch of Harry in the night. Um, the two of them. Shakespeare's disguised King Harry becoming one with his troops the night before the Battle of Agincourt. And Harry Hopkins bonding the leaders of the United States, Great Britain, the Soviet Union. The two of them shared a gift for connecting. Stalin's, Stalin uh, said that uh, 
Hopkins spoke Pauducia according to soul, and Churchill saw him as a crumbling lighthouse. And to Roosevelt, Hopkins gave his life, asking for nothing except to serve. They were the happy few, and Hopkins was one of them. Thank you. So we have a couple of minutes for questions. Yeah, a couple of minutes for questions. I kind of ran over, I think, but anyway. Anyway, we have some experts in this room who I'm sure can add to this. Is any about his relationship early on with Francis Perkins? Yeah, I, you know, uh, it, the key, the, the key event, I think, probably, uh, he, he got to know Francis Perkins because he was a social worker, and Francis Perkins was very active uh, in New York. Francis Perkins also worked for Roosevelt when he was a governor. Um, and, and she was, I'm sure, instrumental in helping him become uh, part of the uh, Roosevelt's administration when he was governor of New York. But then when, um, when Roosevelt was elected um, and uh, getting ready to put together his administration, uh, Actually, it was after he, I think after he was sworn in, shortly after he was sworn in, and then it was March of, of 1933, uh, at the beginning of the first 100 days, Harry and a friend came down to, uh, to Washington and had a plan for putting people back to work. Harry had had some experience uh, under Roosevelt as a governor and also in the city of New York putting people back to work on infrastructure project. So they came down to Washington, and they didn't have an appointment with Roosevelt, but they did have an appointment with Francis Perkins. And it took place in the uh, what is now the Women's Democratic Club on right off of DuPont Circle in Washington. And the place was jammed with office seekers and people. And the story is that they met under the staircase with Francis Perkins. Hopkins and his friend uh, presented their plan uh, and uh, of course, said, you know, they were pitching, you know, they were pitching for the job. Um, Hopkins wrote some letters um, uh, to the president and others uh, pitching for the job. And Frances Perkins went to Roosevelt because she was much closer to Roosevelt um, and uh, advocated that Hopkins uh, get the job. Hopkins had a quick meeting with Roosevelt uh, in the White House. He was confirmed, like over the, over the weekend. Uh, that well, that was how things happened back in the in the first hundred days, you know. And he was on the job <clears throat> next to where the Corcoran Gallery is today, um, in an old building, uh, which is where he started uh, the first of his jobs programs. Um, so they were close, uh, and they stayed close uh, uh, for uh, beginning in the late 1920s and right through the Depression. I don't know much about their relationship during the war. I mean, Hopkins was devoted entirely to the war. Francis stayed in the administration straight through to the end. I understand that uh, toward the end of his life, Hopkins and Roosevelt uh, had a falling out. Huh? Uh, what was that all about? Well, it had to do with, a, with well, the real, the real reason. It wasn't a falling out. Well. There were, there were two different times when they had falling out. The first of first of one when he got really sick, uh, right after the uh, Tehran conference, uh, he came, they came back and, and Hopkins had to go to the Mayo Clinic for uh, six months, so he was out of it. So they didn't at that point. He just you know he was sick. He was literally in bed for six months. Uh, so when he returned to Washington in July of 1944. You know, he had missed six months of, of, uh, of action, and he was still very weak. Uh, he had also married Louise, uh, Louise uh, Macy in July of 1942, and they lived in the White House for a while, but things didn't work out so well between Louise and Mrs. Uh, Roosevelt, um, and there was probably more, you know, uh, gossip about it than really was warranted. But Louise wanted to move out uh, of the house, and so after the Tehran conference, they also no longer lived in the White House. 
And that was another reason for a separation. Roosevelt did not like the fact that they moved out of the White House uh, because he wanted Harry there all the time. So the sickness and that thing, that created a, uh, a uh, separation between the two. But in the fall of 1944, in the fall of 1944, Hopkins worked his way back into uh, a very close relationship with Roosevelt uh, because he missed the, uh, the big conference in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Quebec in the fall of 1944. That was the one conference Hopkins didn't go to, but that was the conference where they got into the Morgenthau Plan, uh, which really was a, you know, could have gotten Roosevelt in a lot of trouble. It did. Um, and that was the plan to pastoralize uh, Germany. And so, you know, Hopkins, you know, fortunately wasn't involved in it, but he worked himself back into Roosevelt's confidence and kind of pushed Morgenthau aside uh, in the, later the fall of 1944. But one thing that happened in the fall of uh, 1944 and the Christmas of 1940 that was very unusual and I can't figure it out um, is that Hopkins and J. Edgar Hoover put Hopkins' own wife under uh, domestic surveillance by the FBI. And so his wife, uh, Hopkins' own wife, the Paris editor of the Harper's Bazaar, uh, Louise, a very social woman, uh, was subjected to uh, physical surveillance and her phone was tapped and they, they rented a little house in Georgetown. And to this day, I do not, know, I can't figure out exactly why they did that. I think it was national security. I don't think it was because they thought Louise was having a, an affair, like Frank Castiglieri thinks that. Um, I think it was a national security issue, and they thought, I think that they thought Louise was drinking too much, uh, and that uh, she had loose lips. Uh, they were hanging around with the very top people in the military, um, and Roosevelt may have gotten some rumors. So she was under surveillance. Uh, then, the, then uh, <clears throat> the last, uh, after Yalta, this is the second time when there was a separation. After Yalta, Harry never got out of bed at Yalta except for the plenary conferences. He was in bed at Yalta, um, except he'd get up for the conferences. And a lot of action took place inside his room at Yalta, and there's no recording of what conversations were. Anyway, and Roosevelt, of course, was very ill at that point. So they're coming back on the Sir Quincy through the Mediterranean. Uh, Hopkins and Roosevelt. Roosevelt's dearest friend, Pa Watson, had died on board the Quincy. Um, so it was a depressing trip out of the Mediterranean back to the United States. Roosevelt needed to write a speech to Congress about the, the results of the Yalta Conference. He wanted Hopkins to write that speech on the cruise back to the United States from uh, uh, Gibraltar. Hopkins went up uh, came out of bed and went upstairs and told uh, Roosevelt's daughter, Anna, who was with him, I can't do it. I can't. I have to get off this boat. I can't take the trip back to. I'm too sick. And uh, he went up to Roosevelt and told him the same thing. And Roosevelt just looked at him and he thought he, he, he thought that, that Hopkins just didn't want to do the work. Uh, that he was he was kind of, you know, he just wanted to get off the boat to rest. And that, he, you know, it, it was not a pleasant uh, conversation. And Roosevelt barely looked at him. Uh, Hopkins said goodbye, and that was it. That was the last time Hopkins and Roosevelt saw each other. So that was not a, uh, that was not a pleasant parting. Uh, but, you know, Hopkins did get off at Marrakesh with Chip Bolin, and he spent a few weeks there. Uh, and uh, Sam Rosenman actually came down from London, got on the boat, and, and wrote the speech um, that Roosevelt had to give when he got back uh, to, the, to Washington. It's a long way, but there were two different, yeah. Ready? That's it? All right. Thank you.